Oh, so God. Father, we are grateful tonight. We thank you. We thank you because you have great and mighty things in store for us tonight. We thank you because you are going to bring us into new levels of consciousness in you that we have not been before. We thank you because your plans for us are for good to give us a hope and a future. We thank you because you are faithful and there is no one like you. Tonight, we worship you. Tonight, we lift you up. Tonight, Lord, we've come to say thank you. We appreciate you for your goodness and your mercy over us. We thank you for each and every person and family represented here. We thank you for the global discipleship platform that has afforded us this opportunity to come and learn, oh God. We thank you. We thank you because you are here with us, Holy Spirit, to teach us, to unveil things to us. We thank you because the blinders are falling off and our lives will never be the same again that we will live refreshed, we will live strengthened, we will live, oh God, edified in the name of Jesus. And we'll be sure to give you alone the glory for you deserve it. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed, amen. Mm -hmm. Amen, 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 hallelujah. Welcome everyone tonight. I see Pastor Jones, I see Sister Perdida, Minister Coco, Sister Camille, and I Amen. think that's Mama Mildred on the out gave us. Amen. If you have your communion elements with you, we are gonna start with communion tonight as we honor the Lord. We'll be reading from the book of First Peter, chapter two. First Peter chapter two and verse 24. First Peter chapter two, verse 24, it says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. By his wounds, you have been healed. So tonight we are gonna be partaking in the body of Jesus. The Bible tells us here that he bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin. And tonight, as we'll be looking at the consciousness of now, the consciousness we should be living with is not a sin consciousness, but a righteousness consciousness because of the finished work of Jesus, because of him bearing our sin in his body so that we might live a new life. We might live a life of righteousness, not our own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ himself. And he says, by whose stripes you you have been healed. Our healing is a thing of the past. It was already completed. The healing of our physical bodies, the healing of our soul, the healing of our spirit that was separated from God, being reunited with God in Christ Jesus. So tonight we are breaking bread in remembrance of this wonderful mystery that was accomplished in Jesus is going to the cross for us. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for you yourself, Jesus, bore our sins. You yourself took them on the cross that we no longer have to live for sin, but unto righteousness. You brought us a new way of life a new way to think and live, not being conscious of our shortcomings, 
but conscious of your finished work, conscious that you came and gave your own life, your own very nature, your nature of righteousness, taking away the sin nature from us and imputing us with your righteousness. And you, oh, oh God, even completed our healing at that same time. Every pain, every shame, every injury to our spirit, soul, or body, you brought solution. You brought healing at that time, the moment of your death on the cross. We are grateful. We are so grateful for all that you died to purchase for us. And we thank you, oh God, that tonight as we break bread, we are breaking this bread and entering into new level of consciousness of all that you have paid for for us that we should not only inherit, but let it be a reality in our lives tonight. And we give you the glory in the name of Jesus. In the same way, Lord, we thank you for the cup, the new covenant in your blood, the blood of redemption, the blood that bought back everything we had lost in the fall. We are grateful for the blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But we thank you because your blood has been shed. And we thank you that you made provision for the forgiveness of our sins. So we can truly be free to live out all that you have planned and purpose for us. Tonight, we say thank you for your blood. Thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. And we partake with thanksgiving tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Can you break and eat? Hallelujah. Amen. Tonight Amen. is going to be a discussion. So if you're in a place where you can talk and you can unmute yourself so we can engage in this discussion, that would be so wonderful. And if there's somebody that you're invited and the person is yet to come, you can send them a reminder that it's time so we can get on with this there is a lot i don't know that we'll be able to cover all but by the help of the holy spirit we will hit the highlights and whatever you are yet to read hopefully you'll be able to go back to it it's a lot i've learned a lot and there's still a lot i'm still absorbing i'm like lord help me so tonight we are looking at the consciousness of now by dr francis mouse that's a picture of the book the consciousness of now. It's a new order of wisdom. It's living a spirit control, stress-free life in a chaotic world. If you know anything about the world in which we live, you know there's a plenty we can stress about, but here is a way and it has all to do with the consciousness of now. So the book has 14 chapters we'll kind of hit through the highlights of most. And then as we go by, we'll be discussing as things come up, questions, suggestions, or points to discuss. We're here to interact, we're here to learn. You've been reading the book, maybe you haven't read the book, but at least from the conversations, hopefully you will pick something to mull over as we move on, amen. And the the big thing is there is a war on consciousness. And when we talk about consciousness, there's a lot of uh, different definitions by people. When you hear the word consciousness, like uh, Dr. Mouse points out is, people tend to think of like, oh, that's a new age term. How can you be a child of God and you're talking about consciousness? But consciousness is not something of a new age thing. It's something created by God. But because of the fall of man, just like God's plan for man was perverted, so were things in nature and things that God intended for our good, but perverted too, such that sometimes when you're talking about things that 
God created for our good, it's almost like I don't see how that could be of benefit to me. But first, man has three parts, a spirit, a soul, a body. And our spirit is what helps us to be able to have God consciousness, a consciousness of God, because God is spirit and it's our spirit that connects with God, not our physical body. And we have a soul and it is our soul that helps us to be conscious of ourselves. You know how if you listen to a lot of people, they are like, well, that's how I am. Uh, I know myself. This is how I do things. It's your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions that lends itself for you to be able to be conscious of yourself and what is going on with you. And our physical bodies is what gives us a consciousness of the world because it is with our bodies that we interact with others and things that are going on. But the unfortunate thing about all of this is with this uh, different levels of consciousness, the devil has perverted them such that our view can be skewed of what really is. Our view of ourselves can be manipulated by the devil and our view of the world around us can be manipulated too, such that you begin to see such a thing. He quoted an example of some kind of world consciousness where one man led a whole nation to believe so wrongly that they went out killing, almost annihilating a whole race of the Jewish people. And that was in Germany. So you could almost be like, what did they tell these people? And what did they believe that they could act so cruelly towards a group of people. So there is a possibility of that consciousness to be manipulated. But the reason we're here is not just how to see that there is a consciousness, but to come to the reality of the consciousness the way God wanted us to have it, aligning with his word and by the power of the Holy Spirit so we can truly live the life that Jesus died for us to have. Amen. And the reason why we are really wanting to look at the consciousness and coming to that place, we'll, we'll get to define cons consciousness here in just a, uh, a moment. But the reason why we want to come into consciousness is because all the plans, the purpose, the promises of God for our lives will only happen when we get to that place of consciousness. And there are many things that we know passively. Oh, you're like, yeah, I know that scripture, but just your mere knowledge of the scripture is not enough because the reality is not evident in your life. And we want the scripture to be real in our lives, just like it was real in Jesus's life and it was real in the life of the apostles. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if there is something that was real and happened to fathers of the faith, fathers in the faith. How come we are not experiencing it? Is it God that has changed? Definitely not. So if God has not changed, what is it that those people knew that and were conscious of that we don't know or are not conscious of that is affecting our life how, how by negatively? So what is consciousness? The one definition I got out of this that's so stuck with me, there are four different definitions we'll look at, but the one that stuck out to me was the definition of the real presence of God in the now. That is consciousness. Where God is real to you here and now, he's not a God of the future. He's not the God who will do something tomorrow or who will be more real tomorrow because he can be as real in the now, right now, in your life and in every circumstance. The, is, let me read it. It said, consciousness is a realization of the glory of God and the reality of the living God. It's not just a story that people say God is real, but you yourself experiencing that realness in your own life right now. Not just praying and hoping that it may happen, but right now experiencing that. Consciousness is the awareness of the daily experience and interaction of your spirit and soul with the Holy Spirit. So your relationship with the Holy Spirit is real here and now. It's, of course, it's, as we get into more consciousness, it is more real, but 
accepting today that that is available for me right now and I can walk in it. It's consciousness. And then the other definition said consciousness is the tangible embodiment of a revelation that a person has come to believe and trust in so completely that acting in accordance to that revelation is first nature to the said person. So you believe that Jesus is healer. So you live your life in the reality of that healing. Not in the reality of the aches and pains in your body, but it's like your first response to having a call is, I am the healer of the Lord. It's not where is some cold medicine for me to take. Not knocking the place of medicine, but it's like, what is more real to you in your consciousness now? So that is consciousness, that the word you believe that God has said in his word is so real to you that that is what you live like. You don't have Amen. to think about in it. Air. To <laughs> me, it's like your first response to a situation is what the word of God says. Your first answer to a situation is what the Bible says. It's what you believe, not just what is written, but what is written has become your reality, such that that's how you respond to life circumstances. And of course, we are all a work in progress. And as I was reading out, like, yeah, we all have a long way to go, but thank God we are not where we used to be, and we are in motion, and we are progressing. And thank God for the plat this platform where we are able to get to know about material like this that have been out for years that can benefit us along this journey to come into the consciousness. It's a consciousness is the reality is the realization of the original you in Christ in God before all the man-made and demonically engineered program programming was superimposed on your person. And the example that he used here is the example of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter one, God is talking to Jeremiah. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah is like, uh, but, but I don't know how to talk. This paraphrasing, I'm not reading word for word. He said, but I don't know how to talk and I am young and I can't do it. And God tells him, do not say that you are but a child because you're going to do what I say you should do. You will say what I say you should do and you will not be afraid of them. For you were made for the raising of many and for the pulling down of many. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Sister Perita. Verse seven, he said, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in my mouth. See, I appoint you today over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow to build and to plant. So each and every one of us, before we landed on planet Earth, there is a you, there is a me that was in Christ, in God, before we showed up on this planet. Trouble is, we showed up on the planet, we interacted with the things of the world, maybe didn't get to know Christ when we were young, did a lot of things, and then we came to know Christ. So now we are a new creation in Christ, but we have all this programming that have been going on in our lives that we now have to deal with destroying because we have to destroy those consciousness that are not aligning with who we are in Christ, with the real us. Because the real you was in Christ, in God, before you showed up on planet Earth. And most of us may not have discovered who we are in Christ, in God, before we showed up, even though we have given our lives to Christ. 
which now makes it difficult for us to go ahead to accomplish and fulfill God's plan for our life. But thank God there is hope and the beginning point of discovering this, to, of coming into consciousness and discovering who we were or are in Christ, in God, is giving our lives to Christ. Because when we give our lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. And it is the Holy Spirit working in us that brings us into this consciousness. Amen. I'm going to pause right there and open up for comments, thoughts, questions before we move on. Amen. Anybody has a question, has a comment? So far, so good. All right, thank you. I was going to say something, but I was just waiting for other people to say something. But anyway, um, when um, the first time I ever, uh, I told Pastor Jones this too, before I ever, well, I think I just gotten saved, but um, I never, I never really knew anything in the Bible. And I especially didn't know Jeremiah chapter one. Definitely didn't know it. But the Lord spoke it to me. I heard it clear as day. The one through five, Jeremiah chapter one, one through uh, five through 10, literally heard it. And I never did understand that, you know, until years and years later. And I'm still coming to the realization of what it, what it means. I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Evangelist Chen. Anybody else wants to make a comment or ask a question or share something before we move on? Amen. Amen. I just want to acknowledge what uh, Evangelist Chen just said. Thank you, Mama Roda or explaining to us uh, the being of a consciousness. This is, uh, like she said, she heard that before she even read the Bible, before she read the book of Jeremiah. I have a incident too about Jeremiah 37, where the Lord was asking Jeremiah, what do you think of those dry bones? I saw that in a dream before I even read about it. All of that is just telling us who, the Lord planned for us to be before even we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It's our testimony that the Lord, before he formed us, he knew us and he has all this plan for us. What we just read in Jeremiah 1. I just wanted to add that. Thank you for sharing, Mama Coco. So God has a plan for you and you and you and each and every one of us. And sometimes like Evangelist June shared, you might hear the scripture. You wouldn't know it's scripture, but you just hear something so powerful today. Then you stumble upon it in the Bible and you're like, oh, that was in the Bible. But we thank God for the Holy Spirit who was always speaking to us. But then, like I said, we come into this consciousness, our point of entry is getting the indwelling of the Holy Spirit through our believing in Jesus and receiving him as Lord and Savior, and then letting him lead us to a consciousness, to a mind, a heart, a spirit that is focused on Christ, set your heart, the Bible says set your heart high set your mind on things above not on things below and that's our goal and then that's how we go into but then talking about the issue of stress so why are we so stressed if you turn around in the world everybody's like i'm so stressed i am stressed i am stressed how was work today stressful how are the children stressful it's like everything 
has some degree of stress attached to it. And why is that so? It is because we are considering and taking thought of our lives. In the book of Luke chapter 12, verse 22 to, uh, 24 to 26, consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? So stress is rooted in us worrying and anxious about the basics of life, really is what it is. Food, water, clothing. Is it legitimate to be concerned about things like that? Are they necessities? Yes, they are basic necessities. We need to eat food so this body can keep going from A to B. But is it so important that we will allow it burden us and eventually take us out without us accomplishing God's plan for us? No. So if we can realize that God who is able to take care of birds, you know, birds are out in the, in the weather, in the sun, in the heat, in the summer, in the winter, they are out there and the Lord sustains them. They don't participate in the law of sowing and reaping, but they don't lack their everyday needs. And we of more value than they, you would think that because we have this high intelligence, God has made us the epitome of his creation that we will know better, but still we don't. But why? Is it that we think we are wiser than God and we can handle it ourselves? Because it says that that's what the, those who don't believe in God think of. So if those who don't believe in God are worrying about those things and we will believe in him, are worrying about the same things. What is the difference? There's supposed to be a difference between us, the children of the kingdom of light. There has to be a difference between us and them. So if somebody who does not know Christ is stressed and worried, and you who knows Christ is stressed and worried, what is the testimony? So I should just believe God and still be stressed and worried when I can be stressed and worried without believing God. There has to be a difference. Yes, ma'am, you can answer. Go ahead. My answer is just going to be one sentence. It's because we don't know our identity in Christ. Amen. There you go. Thank you. We don't know our identity. Can I add to that? Yes, ma'am. So not only do we not, and that's very good. Not only do we not know who our identity in Christ is, but we don't know how to trust either. Because for me, I was always doing, I was always doing things in my own strength, right? Until the Lord taught me how to trust him. And now I trust him. You know, yes. I feel like people need to be, they, they need to be taught. And the only one that can teach us to, on how to trust God is the Holy Spirit through the circumstances or situations that we go through. Amen. Thank you, Evangelist John. We are doing things in our strength. We don't know who we are, but there is just so much that has been delivered to us 
See what Matthew chapter 11 from verse 24, 27 to 30 says. This is Jesus talking. All things have been delivered to me by my father. And no one knows the son except the father. Nor does anyone know the father except the son. And the one to whom the son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is a wonderful invitation by Jesus himself. I like it says that no one knows the father except the son and the one to whom the son, the son wills to reveal him and he wills to reveal him to us. For this is eternal life to know the father and him whom he has sent the son. That is what God calls us into. And it's a progressive revelation day after day for us to know the Father as the Son reveals it through the Holy Spirit. Like Evangelist June mentioned, bringing us to a place of trust, but not by ourselves or by the Spirit. But you see, this is an invitation. It says, come unto me. So the coming is up to you. If you are laden, he is saying, come. So one, you have to be willing to come. And he has rest available for you. And we all need rest, not just physical rest as in sleep, but rest of your soul, rest of your spirit. And we can find rest in him. There is rest in him. Rest from all kind of exhaustion we can find in Christ. But it is tied to this invitation, come. So the first coming is when we give our life to Christ. And after we give our life to Christ, there is still that come. For example, in the area of trust, like Evangelist June mentioned, come, trust me. Come, let me show you how to do this thing. Yes, you've been doing it this way for a long time, but I have a better way to do it. Would you let me help you? And being willing to say, okay, I can't do this by myself. I want your help and your way of doing it. The world has a way of doing things. You know, you go to A, B, C, and then you arrive at D. But he has a way that he can say, okay, D is what you need. And you don't have to live from A to D to B to C to get to D. I can get you from A to D. This is the way. But sometimes his ways can all but look so impossible. It might risk you getting laughed at, getting mocked. It might risk you missing out on some of the seemingly good things of life temporarily. But ultimately, the invitation is an invitation unto rest. Because it might be like, yeah, you want to live what you think is a good life. So you're going to work three jobs just so that you can live up to a certain standard. And you'll be like, you don't have to be living to please anybody. Just with this one job and this little place with peace in me, you will live a good life without all the external trappings to please anybody. Come unto me. Come unto me. He said, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. So the same way uh, Dr. Miles was talking about getting the burden. All the time, you know, when I thought about the scripture, I was thinking of, you know, a literally load you carry. But he's like, no, his burden is light. Literally light. God is light. In him is not darkness at all. The burden he's calling us to carry is not some physical or spiritual burden. It is him. He's calling us to carry. He is calling us to carry him. He is light. 
And that is what he wants us to carry. Carry the light into every situation of life. Carry that light into every circumstance. Carry that light into every misunderstanding. Carry that light into every burdensome situation. Light. Light is understanding. Light is, what word can I use? Light is insight. Light is revelation. That's what he wants you to carry into every situation of life. So what is it that has been bothering you? Because most of the time we suffer because we don't have light. We are grappling in darkness in that situation. So what if you carry this burden of light into that situation? Instead of knocking your head for 10 years, trying to figure it out, just rest in him and wait on him. And in one month, you overtake what you wouldn't have done in 10 years. Is that not light? Is it convenient to the flesh? Definitely not. But it is a light burden. He said, learn of me. Learn of him. What did Jesus do even while he was here on earth? He didn't go around doing things by himself. He said, I say what I hear my father says, and I do what I see him do. And by the grace of God, we will get to that place. Not in the far future, but very here and now, where we will speak what he speaks and do what he does. But we need to come into that level of consciousness that one, that realm is available for you. And the invitation is open, come. Come. One, you have to be willing, and two, you have to be obedient. For if we are willing and obedient, then we will eat the good of the land. So come, learn of me. I am gentle and lowly. Pride opens the door for those insidious demonic technologies that cumulatively create pain and stress in our relationships. Humility, on the other hand, guarantees us a powerful standing before the presence of God. I am gentle and lonely. What have you robbed yourself of because of pride? What have you robbed yourself of because of lack of gentleness? Gentleness is relating to others. Gentleness in talking, gentleness, in receiving even seemingly bad news. What has your response of anger cost you? Learn of me. That is Jesus's invitation. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, 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 hallelujah. Okay, I'm gonna hold it right there. Let us talk. Any comments, questions, concerns before we move on? Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Any comments before we go? Go ahead, Sister Favor. Yeah, I always understand the the burden, the the yoke that uh, Jesus Christ is talking about. It's uh, the persecution that we we have, we we face as a believer. But okay, that was good. I understand it now. Well, thank you. You're welcome, Sister Faber. Thank you. We're gonna move on with the power of consciousness. That's the next chapter. And in this chapter, the focus is really about one of the, those definitions where it talks about the very real interaction with the Holy Spirit, unbroken fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So your relationship, <laughs> hallelujah, our relationship with the Holy Spirit, you know, for all of us, it might be different, but some of us, we gave our life to Christ and you know that Holy Spirit came to live in you and he's your soul for salvation. But it's like, that was about the extent of it. You know that he's the third person of the Trinity, but 
We never learned that you can have a real, everyday, ongoing, vibrant relationship with him. But that is what is really available to us. Because the Bible says in the book of John chapter, John chapter 16, from verse 12 to 15, this was Jesus talking to his disciples before he went to the cross. In John chapter 16, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will tell you things to come. He would not speak of himself. He would tell you things to come. And the Holy Spirit is here now. Because Jesus said, if he doesn't go, the Holy Spirit will not come. But thank God he went and the Holy Spirit has come. So he is here active on earth. And when we give our lives to Christ, he comes to dwell in us. But that is just the beginning. It is not the end. The same way Jesus told his disciples, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. There is so much more the Holy Spirit wants to teach you. He wants to teach me. And sometimes in the state where we are, we cannot bear them. <laughs> and sometimes because we cannot bear them, he will only take one thing at a time and walk with us through. So when we are able to bear the next thing that he wants to tell us. But wouldn't it be beautiful if everything he had for you, he could tell you and you were able to embrace and handle them and be able to handle things of life. But we need to come to that consciousness that he is available. He is available to teach us the things that we need to know. He's available to tell us things that are yet to come. He is mm -hmm. available and they are in him. The Bible says that nobody knows the things of a man except the spirit. That's in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 10 to 12. But the spirit of the man and the spirit of God is the spirit of God. And he searches all things, even the deep things of God. So what level it is in God that you want to go to, it is in the Holy Spirit. And he that searches it can search it out and reveal it to you too. So this is not all up to God because God has done his part. It is our part to respond to what is already freely available to us. The, mist, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. God is truth. In him, there is no lie at all. So if the Holy Spirit is his spirit, he is the spirit of truth. It will tell you the truth about whatever is going on without minding how you feel about it. You might think you were so right in winning that argument and just showing down to prove that you knew what was going on. Uh, he will tell you the truth about that situation. He'll be like, yeah, you might have been right, but you have destroyed, the, you have destroyed that brother. You have destroyed that sister by your showdown of thinking that you are right. You sure showed down. You were in your right, but you could have been humble and let that person be. But no, you destroyed their morale. You destroyed their ego. They might not be able to stand up tomorrow. And he will tell you that without being afraid of what your response will be. And that one that you might be despising and thinking that they are nothing, he will show you they are up to something. Look at Peter, uh, no, Ananias, when... Uh, God told him, go and pray for Paul that he might receive his sight. He's like, hey, hold on, God. Is this the same soul that I heard has been killing Christians? And now you want me to go pray for him? He said, yeah, I want you to go pray for him because he is my chosen vessel to bring my word to the Gentiles. 
So what if Ananias uh, was not communing with the Holy Spirit? What if Ananias say, uh, I know what you're saying, God, but hey, uh, I'm not up to for this kind of tax uh, because I don't want to get killed <laughs> for all the stories I've heard. This is a trap that you're trying to set up for me. But no, that's because he had a vibrant relationship with the Holy Spirit. Even sometimes in my life, I'm like, hey, God, uh, what's going on here? Because uh, I don't hear you saying nothing. What have I taken and put in the way that is clouding me from hearing your voice? Because the Holy Spirit knows what is to come. He searches the deep things of God. I like the way Dr. Miles put it. He said, he is God's search engine. So before there was Google and uh, what's the other one? Bing and Yahoo and all the search engines, the Holy Spirit is the deepest search. And whatever man hides, he can search it out. There is nothing hidden before him. All things are laid bare before God. And if they are laid bare before God, they are laid bare before the Holy Spirit. Those things that was done deep, deep way back in your ancestry that you know not about, he can take it and reveal it to you. If it will bring him glory, if it is something that you need to break free from and you don't know of it, he can dig it up and show you to bring you out. So there is nothing that is hidden from him. He can search it out for you. But the thing is, you have to be willing to cultivate the relationship. It's a relationship. Relationships don't just happen. You have work to do when it comes to relationship. But we thank God for his word is there. And as we read it, we thank the Holy Spirit for there to open our understanding. And the encouraging thing is, if it doesn't happen today, you keep at it and keep at it. It will come, don't give up. Because sometimes you might be like, it looks like I've been at this thing for years and there is no change. When big trees, for example, are planted, the surface does not look like any seed went into the ground. There is watering going on, the years are passing, not even a leaf above the ground to show that there is something under that ground, but it is building roots. And when it comes, breaks through that surface and starts growing, there is no stopping it. So don't let the lack of greenness above the surface of your life. Don't let the devil use that to deceive you to say that all the work that is going into building roots is a waste of your time because it is, there is no time invested in growing in the Lord that is wasted. Don't feel like, well, I don't have the eloquence, I don't know the grammar, I don't know how to talk, I don't know any scripture, I can't put anything together, so why even bother? There is a day coming, the day of your breaking forth, the day of your shining forth, and you want to keep preparing for that day because you don't want to be found wanting, amen. So we have the Holy Spirit, he is available for you, he is available for me. And God does not want us to be afraid because he who takes care of the birds can take care of us. Just coming into this consciousness that there is nothing that you need that he cannot provide. It's a mighty stress reliever that no amount of antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication can take away from you. Hallelujah. Comments, please, questions, contributions. Sister Rada. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, you did the whole job. Uh, I explained it well. You put everything in order. Thank you a lot. Amen. Uh, so my addition is uh, this consciousness uh, really needs maturity in spirit. Because what the Holy Spirit is asking is you have to be conscious about what he wants, what Jesus wants, and to deny or to become unconscious for ourselves, which is Mr. Flesh. And Mr. Flesh is always dealing with the emotions. But if this emotion, we still have our emotion, we still are conscious about our uh, how we are hurt about this, we are anger about this, 
about these things, this situation happen, we, we cannot walk right with the Holy Spirit. I know many pastors, those, those that are gone in spirit, uh, the, there's other like they lost their parents and in the day of the funeral, they will go and they will minister. How can somebody do this? This is just a level of consciousness, level of maturity, because I cannot mm. lose my mom now and I go to preach. And you know, I'm still a person, I'm still a human being, but this just uh, need a spiritual growth a maturity to, to, to walk with the Holy Spirit and to just deny yourself of many, many, many times, many situations, many reasons to just keep denying yourself. And, um, and I can see this level of uh, consciousness. Uh, for me, the, the, the biggest example is when it's come for marriage. Very first Yeah, because always when you, you, when you, when you, when you, when you are about to marry, like, or you are in the age of marriage, you no, have really. to like, so the Ali yeah. has obviously um, continued the work on the two legs. Man, so I see this, uh, the consciousness in, uh, my example is when it comes to, uh, to marry, because uh, when we want the, uh, the person that the Lord choose for us, we have to be conscious, filled with the Holy Spirit. But if we still um, have this emotion or we're still conscious about our desires, we will not make it. Of course, we will choose wrong because normally what God wants is totally different from our choice. Uh, so this is my best example. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Febo, for sharing. I'm glad you brought that up because in uh, rounding up this chapter, uh, there is a passage of scripture that um, Dr. Mouse used, which most of the time, or at least all my experience growing up and the use of that scripture is in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3 to 7, and it's talking about food offered to idols. So on the surface of all I've ever learned is as a child of God, you stay away from food offered to idol because if you eat food offered to idol, it's almost like you are worshiping or revering or acknowledging that idol. But it starts, but if any man loves God, the same is known of him. And then it goes on to talk about food offered to idol. And he, he brought up a very interesting perspective to this scripture. He said, if any man love God, the same is known of him. And it says that all other gods are creations of men, but there is only one God. So if the consciousness of God, the creator, so consumes you, food offered to idol will not be an issue. Because he's saying, I can eat it. And for me, it wouldn't be a problem because the idol is nothing. The person I revere in my heart is God. And God knows that I revere him. So idols are in, not a concern thing for me. I can eat the food offered to them and it's of no use. And it's of no impact to me. But then he says, there are people who are weak in conscience. And you don't want to do that. Because when they see you do that, it will hurt them. Because they have not come to that consciousness that idols are nothing. God alone reigns supreme. So for the sake of the weak brother or sister in their presence, I will essentially this for talking, I will not eat the food offered to idols because I will hurt their conscience. They might go home thinking I have backslidden Whereas I haven't, I just have a superior consciousness of the reality of God more than the power or the power of an idol or whatever the 
deity is that the foot were offered to. So the example you gave about, you know, a man of God, a pastor, you know, losing a parent and then having to preach at the funeral. It's like they have come into a higher consciousness of death is a passageway. And we, if Jesus tarries, are all going to go through it. And as a child of God, even when you go through death, which by the way, was not God's intention for any human being to ever experience, apart from the fact that, you know, sin came into the world, then death along with sin came. It was not something that God meant for us to experience. But because of the fall, it's one of the things that is part of the experience of human nature. But if we sustain that consciousness of God being more than the passing of a loved one, we can be able to stand and do what we need to do. And like you put it, the flesh might not feel the most comfort, but when we let that consciousness of who God is and the passage of death as just an entrance into life for those who know Christ, is say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I'm physically not here, but then I am with the Lord. That consciousness will help you be able to preach, encourage, help others so that you don't allow yourself and them coming to sympathize with you, drag into a, a pit of depression that you don't need to go into. Amen. Any other comments before we move on? Thank you, Pastor Jones. I'm going to read that out to everyone. One of the way we get to the place of consciousness with the Holy Spirit is not relating ourselves as human beings but a speaking spirit having a human experience. That is so wonderful, Pastor Jones. We are a speaking spirit and we're having a human experience. We are living in a body which allows us to interact with this physical world. And if every moment we realize that, and not that things are happening to us, but that we are just passing through along, along the way, with incidents going on and we are just moving right along so nothing is here to stay it is a passing by then some things will not affect us the way they do if we change our perspective which is the consciousness we are talking about because if you come to that realization that hey i am a stranger mama midra used to say i am a surgeon i'm a stranger on this earth teach me to walk in your wisdom when we realize that I am just passing by here. So no matter what happens or is happening, it is temporary because there is more than this. Then some things will not have the devastating effects that it may have on others on us because it is but temporary, hallelujah. And then the next chapter talks about time. We live in time. Our, our world is, quote unquote, governed by time. But time, as we know it, is a fallen king. God created time. Time, intention by God was to be a servant of his. Time was to be a servant of man. The man God created was not to be a servant of time, but for time to be his servant. But unfortunately, when that man fell, so the time fall. To the extent that in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter three, King Solomon is talking about time. There is a time for everything under the heavens. There is a season, this version says season. Some other versions say time, a time and purpose for everything under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. 
So if you look at it almost, it's like, okay, there is a negative as you keep going down and say a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up. But it wasn't God's intention that time as a womb that has to deliver things will be delivering negatives and positives. But we see that because of the fallen nature of man, time is fulfilling both divine and demonic orchestrations at the same time. Like I said earlier, man wasn't meant to experience death, but because of the fall, there is a time to die. There is not a time to kill and a time to kill. There shouldn't have been a time to be killing. But now in the womb of time, it has been programmed that there has to be a time to kill and then a time to heal. That was not God's intention. Of course, the one of planting and plucking up is embedded in the law of seed, time, and harvest. So <laughs> it almost seems like there was seed and harvest. There was not supposed to be a time in between. But because time fell, now there is a time. And sometimes because of that continuum of time, our lives are impacted because in our world, which we mostly look at it as linear, which is a line, linear, you think of a line, we have our, our past, we are now here in the present, and we are looking forward to a future. Now, past, future. But the only time we really have is now. The past, we have gone through it. And the future, we don't know about it, but thank God our future is in him because what has been and what is to be has already been in him. So even if we have had bad experiences in our past and we can bring them to him, he can redeem that and make all things beautiful in his time. He can make all those things work together for our good in the now. And fretting about the future does not help us. He says, there is enough trouble for today to worry about. Instead of borrowing the one from tomorrow and bringing it into today. So focus in the now. So God is wanting us to live a now and experience him in the now. Not that the now faith. You know, just looking at this chapters, it makes me realize why the Bible says now faith is the substance of things hoped for, but it is now. So it doesn't have to be 10 years down the road. It can be in the now. Does that mean it will manifest in your physical right now? Maybe not. Because if you are believing for a baby and you receive your baby now, we are going to carry the baby in nine months. <laughs> but we are receiving the baby now. If we are receiving that corn harvest now and we put that seed in the ground, we are going to hold it in our hands in three months, but it is now we are getting it. Because if we don't get it now, there's going to be no manifestation tomorrow. So when we are talking and uh, relating to talking about now, God's time, God doesn't have a past or a future. God is the now God. He is the I am present i am and coming into this consciousness of god is the i am it is not if you wish or if you can maybe sometime later it is right now god because right now here all his power is available all his provision is available everything that he died for you to have is here and now and you can have it And sometimes breaking through the barriers of our past or our experiences or what is going on to be able to tear that thing down to be here in the now. It's just like you saying, okay, I'm going to spend some time in the presence of God. And when you go sit down, you have to quiet yourself. It's like you have to take okay, I'm supposed to write an exam tomorrow, throw it out. Uh, I don't know what I'll eat tomorrow, throw it out. I don't, whatever. The problem I had yesterday. 
uh, I'm not, my brother and I have an issue, throw it out. It's like being able to, whatever is standing as a hindrance to you experiencing his fullness here and now, you have to cast it down. Whatever you might have learned in the past that say, for you to encounter God, you have to spend many, many years. Is our walk with him progressive? Yes. But to know that it is all available in the now and you can have it. So when he says, when do you want your deliverance? It won't be tomorrow. It is right now. So you won't be like Pharaoh who said, when do you want the frogs gone? And he said, tomorrow, no. There is no tomorrow. It is here and now. Let it be gone. Amen. And that is one way for us to get ahead of this stress that we are experiencing. And it talks about redeeming the time because the days are evil. So how do we redeem the time? One is by following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So our relationship with the Holy Spirit is a very important and vital relationship we have to develop and build up because he will be the one to help us redeem the time. And the second one is walking in wisdom. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Colossians chapter four, verse six. And we know the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom. So by the time we are all done tonight, we'll come to realize that what we need to be able to live in this consciousness is the person of the Holy Spirit. And he is here. He is available. And if you have given your life to Christ, he is very much present and resident in you. And you can tap from his bounty all of this bounty that is available and then there's an interesting story that he uses here the story of the fig tree is interesting because i've always wondered about why the story of the fig tree and it's in a uh, the story is the book of mark chapter 11 where jesus and his disciples they were walking into a city and the bible says that the fig tree had green leaves, but it didn't have any fruit and it wasn't the season of figs. But the fig tree normally when it has green leaves, it means that it has fruit. But this fig tree had green leaves and Jesus wanted figs and there were no figs. And the Bible says there that it was not the season of figs, yet he cursed the tree. The way the Bible puts it, it said Jesus answered the tree. So the tree was talking to Jesus. We don't know exactly what the tree told Jesus. Maybe the tree was telling Jesus, you know, you cannot be asking me for fruit because you know it's not yet my time to bear fruit. But Jesus here is showing us something that we don't have to subject our lives to the timing of how things go in life. They say you will have to walk two years to get a promotion and then you will have to walk some three more years or five years to be able to go up and get this salary range. Before this thing can happen to you, it has to go X, Y, Z. But if we walk in this authority and in this consciousness that Jesus is showing us here, the, the, the principle he's teaching us here is we don't have to walk by the dictates of time as the world has said it. Because if the world say harvest is in four months time and the Holy Spirit says your harvest is now, it is time to get your storehouses ready for the harvest. Because he knows something you don't know and you better be following his directives. If they say this cannot be done, you can stand up and say it can be done because the Holy Spirit has told you it is happening now. And you are partnering with him because you would rather want to partner with the Holy Spirit than to partner with what the world is saying. Because the Bible also says that when they will be saying in the world there is peace and safety, then there will be sudden destruction. So we cannot be going by 
what it feels like. They can say there's an economic downturn, but God is saying, invest in that. Invest in that particular stock. Invest in that particular portfolio. Plant that particular seed. There's a movie I watched some time ago. Is the title is Fit Like Potatoes. And they had a serious drought. There was no water. They had not had rain. And this guy was believing God. And God told him to plant his potato seed. So the little he had left in the midst of all of this, he did the most in terms of parcels of land, all his workers, he got everybody out and they walked. He borrowed equipment from the neighbors because they were like, there's no rain, there is no use in trying to plant. So everything he had, he planted it because the Holy Spirit instructed him to plant those potatoes. And there was no rain. So they waited, the time passed and it was time for harvest. So they woke up and prepared for harvest and they went out to harvest. And when he went digging up, there were some huge potatoes that had come in that time. There was no rain, there was no watering, but at the instruction of the Lord, he planted the potatoes and the potatoes grew and he had an awesome harvest. He had the neighbors come to help to harvest because of the so much harvest that he got in a season of drought. And we have an example in the Bible of Isaac. It was a time of drought too. And he wanted to relocate because there were things going on better in Egypt than where he was. But at the instruction of the Lord, he stayed where he was. That, book, that story is in the book of Genesis. And the Bible says, and Isaac sowed in that land. And in the same year, he ripped a hundredfold and the Lord was with him. A hundredfold in drought. Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year ripped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich, this is verse 13, and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy by the instruction of the Lord. Another example is an example of the king, Jehoshaphat, who got up one morning and he had these armies of different nations come to fight against Israel. And he was terribly outnumbered. And he went into the house of the Lord and said, Lord, what shall we do? And the Lord said, you shall not fight this battle. But he, the army got suited up and they put the singers in front and they went forth praising the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercies endure forever. And the enemies fought and destroyed themselves. Are we willing to seek the Lord for his direction and wait for his counsel? Will it seem too archaic or too time consuming for us? That is a question that each of us will have to answer because that same God who gave instruction then that led to victory and prosperity is still available for us today. Sometimes we are so busy about seeing to what we shall eat, drink, and wear that we don't take the time to wait on him to ultimately give us what will far outweigh what we are trying to seek. Hallelujah. So we can learn something from the fig tree. If the Lord says it's time to harvest, even if there is no figs on the tree, there must be a harvest somewhere and we need to ask him where and get ready to go harvest, amen. The beauty of this thing of time going into the next chapter is that even our human time, though it is fallen, God 
still can come in and manifest himself in our time. So they call our time chronos, which is chronological. And in the midst of our chronos, which is this linear time we've been talking about, past, present, and future, the divine God can choose to intercept our time. And we call it the Kairos. An example is when Jesus was born. It had been prophesied and there were signs. And when it happened, we know that some people saw the sign because the Magi say they saw a star from the east and they followed it and it led them to where Jesus was. And in our everyday life, there are moments of Kairos that can intercept. The thing is, will we be aware of those divine interruptions in time to manifest himself? And would we partner with him to do the things that he wants to do? Hallelujah. The Lord can intercept our time. The Lord can intercept our time, but we can also choose to align ourselves with what God is doing in our time. And he's looking for people to do that. When it was time for the baby Jesus to come, Mary, because the Bible had talked, God had prophesied through Isaiah that a virgin shall become pregnant. And when Gabriel appeared to Mary, she didn't say no. She might have said no. And if she did, I'm not sure what would have happened next, but she didn't. It, it, it was like, I have waited all my life for this moment and I am taking it. So will you be ready when your time comes? Will you be ready to say, I'll follow you no matter what. I'll obey you no matter what it costs me. And the truth of the matter is it doesn't matter what it seems like it may cost you now, God can so far above compensate you for all your troubles. The story of the donkey on which Jesus rode is another one. For the donkey was bought, the colt, and it was tied. All along, it was tied. The others were not tied, but it was tied. Waiting for that moment when Jesus said, go and untie the coat. And if any man asks you, say the master has need of him. Are you trying to run ahead of God? Are there things that he has shown you and you feel like it, ha it has to happen right now? Are you weary of your preparation? Because sometimes the time of preparation can be weary. I don't know, as I said, preparation, I just thought about Esther. When they gathered all this, Ladies from around Susa, they all had to go through a time of preparation. There was preparation of their body for the beauty. There was probably preparation in etiquette of how to be like a queen in case you are chosen. And she had to endure all of that preparation. Physically speaking, but thank God that her relationship with God was intact for when the time for that came. She knew this is time for battle and she went into battle mode. Some of us, God has called us into full-time ministry. So you're given to the ministry of the word and prayer. And there are some that God has called you to different arenas in the business, in the marketplace, in healthcare, wherever the Lord has called you. Don't despise your preparation. Sometimes it might seem long and burdensome. But wherever we have to go, there is a time of preparation. So don't shortchange yourself by not being fully prepared. For when the day of your appearing comes, you want to be ready. Amen. Oh. 
I'm going to open it up for discussion about this time. Time, time, time. Comments, questions. Sister Perita, Evangelist June, Pastor Jones. Sister Pastor Christine. Jones has something to say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I see you smiling and grinning like I got something to say. <laughs> speak, woman of God, speak. Share. <laughs> Evangelist June is putting you on the spot, Pastor Jones. <laughs> That's a journey. There is, we've there's done consequences for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I know you got something good. I don't have anything right now. That's okay. Thank, thank you all for hanging up on with us. It, it, it is it is going well amen amen you know okay. that, that um i'm sorry yeah. what Go you ahead. were saying what you were saying about the fig tree was um so good because you know i literally was talking to um a lady this morning and i literally was talking about the fig tree and my version and your version were so different but it was like, but the way you, the way you were saying it, how you were, how you were giving, um, saying it, it, it made sense. It made sense to me. Also, um, Sister June, the revelation the, or the, the way uh, okay. Sister Rhoda gave the example of the fig tree there's not just one example so it's not that yours didn't make sense is the way that god gave it to her for the, for now mm -hmm. and he gave you yours for then because i have one also that neither one of you had mentioned amen mm -hmm. amen yes i understand that and see i told you um pastor jones has something to say <laughs> And you see, that's the but, beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to say something going back. Um, when you when you were talking about when you said, um, you know, I'm not eloquent to speak, and you know, I don't say the right words, or I don't put my words together. You were like right in my head. Yeah. Because I literally said that to Dr. Mildred in a text. I was like, I'm not that eloquent, eloquent to speak. <laughs> you so are. I guess God showed you. I guess God showed me. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Coco. <laughs> we will receive your testimony. I'm ready to receive that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, Hallelujah. I'm ready to comment now. Yay. Um, you know, <laughs> Lord help her. Amen. Amen. So getting back to the comment that I made um, about the consciousness, right? So we we can't think like the world does. And we can't think like the unsaved does, you know, because we are speaking spirit in a body, having a human experience, right? So in order for us to really be, the Bible said that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from, cleanses our conscience from dead works, right? And in order for us to get to the place where we're now operating in that realm 
where you and the Holy Spirit can become one, you have to think of yourself as such, as a, as a, a speaking spirit and not just a human. Because when we do, then we allow our emotions to take precedent, right? And so I'm not saying you have to be a stone or a rock either as far as not having an emotion, but we cannot allow the emotion to rule us. We can't let the emotion to lead and guide. Jesus said to his mother, he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time has not yet come. Not that he's disrespecting his mother, but he's moving according to the leading of God. You understand? And we are to do the same. So it's not a matter of, okay, yes, somebody is not well or something is going on in your life, but nothing that's taking place in your life is more important than the Holy Spirit. Nothing. He is the most important person on earth yeah. and he's the most important person, period. And if we are being led by the leader of the governmental office of, of, of God, then we can't be emotional and we can't be uh, vacillating between our flesh and our and our spirit man. So earlier you read in John, I think it was John 16, 12 to 16. Hopefully I get it right. But it was talking about, uh, I have much to say to you, but I can't say it now because you can't, you, you will not be able to bear it, right? The first thing is they did not have the Holy Spirit then. It has not yet been given unto them. And of course they operated, you know, um, as Jesus was walking with them whenever the spirit of God needed them at that time, that's what it is. But thereafter, so now that the Holy Spirit has been given to us, we have to come to a place of consciousness where we start believing beyond a shadow of a doubt what the word is saying. And then as someone had mentioned earlier, who we are in Christ. And that, and that means one of the person that we are is not an emotional one. We can't be emotional and, and, and do this walk. It will not work. It will not work. The enemy will use that as a gateway to magnify whatever it is that he's trying to use against you. And he will certainly use that emotion to get you every time. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing, Pastor Jones. Amen. 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 The lady I was speaking to said exactly what you're saying, Pastor Jones, to me this morning. Amen. Amen. So in line of not being, just being emotional, but living in the consciousness of now and who we are in Christ, we don't have to idolize the past or the future. Living in the past, whether it's past hurts or past glories. Unfortunately, most of the time it's past hurts. It's like, you just don't know what kind of life I've had. You just don't understand. And we keep repeating that as an excuse for not moving forward, for not doing something better. And sometimes we even let that be a blockage to what God has for us to do and what he wants for us to do. But like God can, you can't use the mess like me. So I've messed up so bad. I don't think the blood of Jesus is strong enough to wash me to walk. Really? Amen. Absolutely. That's where we find ourselves stuck oftentimes when, when we, when we had a trauma in a particular area, we are stuck and we can't get over it. And, and the moment you start talking about it, and you're crying like seriously, like it happened yesterday, that thing is still there. You understand? And as I said, the enemy will use that to, mm -hmm. to against you so that you don't get past that place. But when we get to the place where we understand what the blood has done for us, right? And, and that same consciousness that the blood cleanses from, that's what dead works is. And then you take that 
that red line, that the jump line thing that uh, with that book. <laughs> and you can take that and jump over that and get past that and go in the backyard and begin to speak to the earth and all these other things. I'm telling you, <laughs> your conscience will line up like quick. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Pastor John. It's like there's so much reality for us to walk in, but we have to be willing to get over it. You know, the book of Romans say all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do you love God? Has God called you? You believe in Jesus? Yes, he's called you. So those things in the past that have always been a matter of hurt. How about you bring it under the blood and let God make something beautiful out of it? As we were, I was talking about this, I just remember Rahab. She was a well-known prostitute. Even the king knew her. But she did not let that stop her. She saw an opportunity to get in line with this God that makes nations tremble, and she got right in. Come on. And when you read the genealogy in Matthew, guess what? She features. Right there. <laughs> Rahab who was a prostitute Amen. so if you think prostitution is the worst job a person can do come and meet one her name is Rahab and she did not stay that forever but you see when the bible calls her it still calls her the prostitute she didn't stay prostitute forever but just in case you wondered what she did before she was featuring there come on she did a, a lowly job yet yet Amen. God Amen. counted her worthy so what has sister, you done? Sister Rhoda, yes, what you yes. talked about, the burden is light. Listen, if we get to that place where we see Jesus, what he has done and what it does for us, Rahab prostitution was chicken feed, okay? You have Paul who wrote 75% of the Bible and he was a murderer. You understand? So- yeah. The little things that we have done <laughs> is nothing, nothing compared to what the blood has done by removing it. The ordinance that was against us, right? Mm. Yeah. The blood remove all that. So what is there in your way? Nothing. Nothing is in your way but you and I, right? We're in our own way. The enemy... He has nothing to work with if we recognize when the word says, I will be with you always. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And that Jesus is right there, Jehovah Shammah, right mm. there with us. Come on. You can't go wrong. We just need to line up in, as Sister June said earlier, trust God. Trust him. Believe him. And when we do that, great exploits. Amen. 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 So not living in your past or worrying about your future, but knowing that your future is in him and he is here with you to never leave you. So your future is secure because God doesn't change. He's not going to go on retirement and he's not going to stop being God. Just coming to that realization, into that consciousness, that he who created time but leaps out of time has got your back. You don't have to worry. By the way, when you go to bed tonight, you're not going to guarantee you'll wake up tomorrow. So why worry? Amen. You're believing God that you will be here tomorrow and your future, and then you're trying to secure what you don't even you are not guaranteed of seeing. You're trying to worry about it. How is that going to help you now? So why not in this here and now glorify him and do all that he has called you to be now? He said, if we forget the past and stop worrying about the future and focus on the now, the God of the now, the one who doesn't begin, who doesn't end, he knows what is in the past, he knows what is in the future, but he is here here right now with you so it is your job to not take thought of what your tomorrow will be but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness 
So he's telling us what not to worry or be concerned about, but he's telling us what we should be doing instead. So in your every breath, you should be seeking him and his righteousness. And as you do that, every other thing will be added. It will be an addition, an addition. That does not eliminate you from going to work because then we have had this out of balance theory where people are like, okay, I'm just seeking God and I'm not going to go to work. I don't have to do anything. I'll just wake up every day and just stay in the house seeking the Lord, seeking the Lord. And the Lord will rain manna from heaven and pay the bills. Do miracles still happen? Yes. Does he send the finances through people to you? Yes, he does that. But the responsibility he has given you, like I was saying earlier, there are some that are called to the ministry of the word and prayer like the apostles were. But then there were tables to be taken care of and there were people in charge of that. So if you're one of those that had to go out there, don't stop yourself from going out there, sitting indoor and doing what you are not supposed to be doing, wasting time. And while you are out there, remember, you're carrying his light with you there and you can bring hope. You know, there was a time when I was thinking because I've, I've worked, I worked in the penitentiary system and I was like, sometimes it's hard to give these people hope. You know, some of them just come in, it's like they can be telling you some really depressing stories. And I'm like, how do you help these people out? And then up came the story of Joseph. Joseph was innocent, yet he was in prison. But he did not get himself depressed. He kept sharpening up his skills. And when his time came, he was ready for it. There was Paul and Silas who were thrown into jail falsely. But even in the midst of that, they praised the Lord and the power of God shook the prison. And the chief God there came to give his life to Christ and his family. So there is hope. It's like whether you are guilty coming here or you are not guilty, there is something you can make out of your life. You cannot be blaming others, blaming yourself. It's like, get over it. What I am here now, what can I do to make it different when I leave here? But sometimes it's so hard. It's like, there is just some level of hopelessness. And I'm like, God, just give me a word to uplift somebody, to make them quit making excuses so that they can move on to the life you have for them. And the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. We might not have time to go through all of the chapters, but something that um, did uh, catch my attention, which I would like us to talk about, is about uh, the priesthood. Oh, there's a chapter in there about healing, the healing of the soul. Remember, we're talking about all the hurts and disappointment and the abuse or trauma that people have gone through and that has so fragmented the soul, but the blood of Jesus brings wholeness it brings redemption you don't have to stay fragmented because it has been paid for jesus paid for it and you can get yourself back you can come back to the you that you were before christ and uh chapter 11 classifies needs as a witch the witchcraft of needs so focusing on what we think we need that we don't give importance to what God wants us to be doing and his plans and purposes for us. We are like, okay, I need to work because I worked 12 hours. I am so tired. Now I need to rest. And I have to get up again tomorrow to go because I need to work. And you keep doing like that and days and hours are passing and you are not spending time seeking God and fellowship with the Holy Spirit to know what you need to be doing in the now. But if we realize that it is God who supplies all our needs according to his riches and glory. And by the way, I just thought about the children of Israel. The supply might not be in the way you like it. They traveled 40 years in the wilderness. They did not get new clothes but their sandals do not get small or tattered either. So they had their provision. It just wasn't fancy. And sometimes we don't like that. It's like you have a roof over your head. You have provision. It might be a sandwich every day, but you have provision. And sometimes we don't like that. They had manna rained from heaven. It was food, heavenly Angels bread. Even then they complained. 
So we need to watch out for things like that because it's not like that. First, it was that they didn't have food. Now they had food, but they were tired of the food because they were eating the same thing every day. And then they wanted meat so bad. And I always pray, I say, God help me. Because it say immediately they put the meat in their mouth while it was still in their mouth. Leanness came upon their flesh. I was like, God, let me never want something so bad that you don't want for me. That by the time I get it, I am getting trouble along with it. May that not be my portion. So we Amen. need to honor God and keep him first above every need. And we function under a higher priesthood, which is the priesthood of Melchizedek. God is eternal God. The, the priesthood of Levi was a priesthood of men that died. And when one high priest died, they put in another one. But Melchizedek, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 7, he has no beginning, has no end. He doesn't have a mother, doesn't have a father. And he has no end of, he, he, there's no end of his days. And that's the priesthood under which we function. For Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And that's what he calls us into. And we can function in that. But priesthood, there are sacrifices to be made. The priest is not just a priest by name. They are prince in principle and they have things to do. There are sacrifices to make. And we need to be willing to make those sacrifices. In our case, it will be in your time, in fellowshipping with God, in loving others, in giving to others. What the Lord will personally be leading you to do, it might be a little different from what he's leading me to do. But we all have to keep the priesthood active. Because whatever is going to happen in our life is going to be sustained by that foundation. And you want to have a solid foundation on which things are built. Amen. Oh my goodness. There's a good one here too. And it's talking about inventions. The God we serve is a God of witty inventions. And sometimes when it comes to, because now we'll be talking about the country, we'll be talking a lot about being conscious, being conscious of God in the now and all he has done for us. But that's also the place of, imagination and creativity and we are made in the image of God and he created all things if you go to the Genesis account and you see the wonderful things God created and every day we are partakers of his beauty and that same nature that God is in creating is in us and by the power of the Holy Spirit in us he can use us to also bring beautiful things to life that right now is just an issue of imagination and he can give us wonderful great ideas the bible talks in the book of genesis about the man wanting to build a tower that reached to heaven granted that was an ungodly desire that was spoiling what they wanted to do yet god acknowledged that their imagination and the oneness with which they were working on it nothing could stop them so what if you have the holy spirit with you with a powerful witty invention to meet the needs of humanity can you imagine where that will put you and the god and christ you carry in you where that will put him we see daniel in babylon who stood for god and god reveals the secrets of kings to him and he delivered it to them and over different the reign of different kings, Daniel was renowned because he trusted in the God who reveals the secret and he hasn't changed. Are we ready to avail ourselves and live in this consciousness that this God has not changed and the things he did before, he can and will do again in our day and time. Time to discuss before we round up for the night. Amen. Amen. I just have um, one quick comment about when you talked about the people in Egypt that mm -hmm. um, walk in for 40 years and their sandals wasn't messed up and their clothes, they didn't have any. That was a miracle in itself. Mm -hmm. 
that was an absolute miracle. And I was just thinking about it while you were talking, um, how it seems as if time stood still, right? Because mm -hmm. if their shoes wasn't messed up and they walk in for that long, then it is reasonable to think that nobody got old during that period. You know, nothing changed as far as naturally. Um, and if they, and if that was going on, then they would have to outgrow whatever it is that they had on, whether they're wearing it on their foot or so forth. That was a miracle in itself. It was. But I also want to think that maybe it grew along with them because the Bible says that the generation that left Egypt never entered the promised land. They died in the wilderness. But the people who entered the promised land were young ones that were born within those 40 years and grew up. Mm, so, that's true. That's <laughs> people true. got pregnant and they had babies. So their dresses must have stretched in pregnancy. That's and crazy. Got back to normal that's... after they had the baby. Either which way you look at it, it's supernatural. Seriously. <laughs> That's right. Oh, wow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But the thing is, I guess they got used to it that they didn't appreciate God for what he was doing. It's like, it's normal, you know, my clothes just fit. My shoes just fit. It doesn't get old that we don't tend to appreciate God for what he's doing. We're always looking for something bigger and better and True. great and spectacular. True. And if we look at it in that aspect, us as parents, when you're doing for your child and they're ungrateful, it doesn't make you feel good. So I clearly could see God not appreciating their ungratefulness. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And my other thing is, I'm done with that. I I wasn't aware that we were going to do the book in one night. Yeah, I didn't expect that either. Because <laughs> we've been reading the book and like you on chapter 11. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk and uh, and see if there can be adjustments for the next few books because next month we are reading um, the Joseph of Arimathea calling, mm. and the month after that is the Order of Melchizedek. That's a heavy read, and the one after that is the Battle of Orders, and they are way thicker than the ones we've done so far. And you're, you are aware that Dr. Mildred got us reading like 10 books, right? <laughs> so between, between your book, Dr. Dr. Mildred's Mildred book, and Astron, <laughs> look here. I'll just put you guys as an encyclopedia and just call it a day. <laughs> For real. Oh my goodness, that's, that's a lot. I, I just got eight books from Amazon just the other day. And she just did one in one sitting. Huh? <laughs> the Lord is helping us. It, it, it's fast and hard, but the Lord is helping us. He's giving us grace. <laughs> wow. Oh, okay, amen. Amen. I'm going to look at this. That we are not humans. We are supernatural beings. So we're going to just zap through it. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to zap through it you okay I amen. <laughs> mm. any I, other comments I was going to take my time we're going to spend some time in prayer is there uh, anybody who has a prayer request before we go into a time of prayer tonight? Yes. I have a young lady. Uh, she's in Canada. Her name is Dolores. 
Okay. And um, she's in the hospital right now. And she's having difficulty. She's having seizures and breathing issues. But she also have cancer. But right now, those two things are her issues while she's there. Seizures and breathing issues. And her name is Dolores. All right. Okay, family, we are going to thank God for the life of Dolores. And we're going to pray that the healing power of God is going to meet her right now in that hospital in Canada. Let us pray. I have a prayer request. Okay, Sister Jo. Yeah. Um, my heart and my hips and my neck and my knee. Um, um, my heart, my heartbeat is like beating at 36, 40. Um, my hips are bone to bone. My neck is four vertebrae are like really bad. I'm in constant pain. Thank you for sharing, Evangelist June. We're going to pray for Dolores, and when we're done, then yes. we're going to go ahead and pray for Evangelist June. Any other prayer requests before we get started? Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the life of Dolores. We thank you because your plans for her life are for good. I thank you because you came that she may have life and having to the full until it overflows. Every walking of death in her body, trying to affect her lungs, her breathing, give her seizures in her brain, every cancer in her body, we can't curse you in the name of Jesus. We declare the life of Christ over you. We say, Jesus, breathe your life into her right now. From the crown of her head to the sole of her feet, let your healing power flow in the name of Jesus. I thank you that you are working every cell tissue organ in her body system. And it is beginning to function aright and align correctly in the name of Jesus. Whatever yes. has that seizures in her brain, we say, peace be still in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Whatever is affecting her breath, whatever is holding her breath, we say, let go now in the name of Jesus. And we declare your healing over her body. And we yes, thank Lord. you in advance because we will testify and give you glory for your finished work in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are going to lift up Evangelist June. The Bible says like we read that by the stripes of Jesus, she was healed. So her healing is complete. It was so is and will be manifested in her body. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your daughter, I thank you because you align those vertebrae and the hips and every joint works together to really accomplish good. your purpose. Yes. Hips, you are working to accomplish the purpose of God. And every cartilage lost in you right now in the name of Jesus. There will yes, be so. a rebuilding. There will be a reviving. There will yes. be a renewal in the name of Jesus. And you vertebrae in the neck we speak to you in the name of Jesus. Come into alignment in the name of Jesus. Whatever yes. is missing in you, we <laughs> command you in the name of Jesus to come into alignment now in Jesus' name. And we yes. command every pain, get out of that body now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For Jesus bore your pain, he bore your grief, he bore every manner of infirmity. Yes. So you might go free. So we declare your freedom. We say, take in the name your of freedom Jesus. now in the name of Jesus. They will get your hands yes, off Lord. that body in the name of Jesus. The body, you, this body is the temple of the mm. Holy Spirit, not of pain, not of sickness, not of disease. Thank you, Lord. Receive a jolt from the Holy Ghost now in Jesus' name. You beat in alignment, you beat in regular, normal sinus rhythm. Whatever yes. has upset you and slowed you down, I don't care where you came from today because of the finished work of Jesus. 
come yes. into alignment in the name of Jesus. In the name of Father, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Glory. We give you praise, Lord. Yes, I want Lord. us to thank the Lord for what he has done in thank the life you, of Father. his daughters tonight. Lord, we glory thank you. To your name, we Jesus. thank you because when we call you, you hear us and you thank answer you, us. Lord. We give you glory, Lord, because all that is Thank left you, is for testimonies of your goodness. Yes. Testimonies of your glory. And we will be sure to give you all the glory because you are the one that heals. You say in your word that you are the one that heals us and thank you because the healing is done and it is perfected now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want us Amen. to lift up our voices and say, Lord, help us to live in the consciousness of all Lord, that you have us got to in us. That it will be our everyday Lord, reality. Help us to live in the consciousness. Lord, help us to live in the like men talk to and fro by the we winds, can be of by, by the, the winds, I thank you, Lord God, that I shall thank you, Jesus. Bless your holy name, O God. That I shall live in thank the you, Lord. Up with your Glory and your to God. I thank you, Lord God, that my ears are open to hear. Thank you, Lord, that we live in the consciousness of now. All that you have accomplished for us, I in Holy the Spirit, we come submitting we ourselves to you Hallelujah. in the name of we Jesus. We are going forth with this Nazareth. reality of all Holy you Spirit, have done have for your us. Way. And Lord, have your divine way in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord as we yield us to you, my body, soul, and spirit, will begin to give way. That we will walk in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that of Nazareth. Plan, God, help us to recognize and to believe and trust that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all dead works in the name of Jesus, that we do not have to live in the consciousness of the past in the name of Jesus, that we can move forward in you because we, we are sure recognized who you are, Father, who we you are in you Lord, in the name of Jesus. You. We God, we bless you and we praise you tonight in the name for your word Jesus in the name of Christ. Jesus Christ. Father, of we, thank you. we bless we you, O oh God, and we praise you because there is saved. none like you. We glorify you, O oh God, that we you are a God that you not only love us, O oh God, but you demonstrate your love for us in the name of Jesus Christ that we might live. And so for that, we just praise you, O oh God, and we thank you that you will do according to your word. You said you watch over it to perform it. And, and we just give you praise, oh God, that whatsoever you have started in us, you're able to finish it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we give you praise. Have your way, oh God. Have your divine way, Lord. We give you In the mighty name of Jesus. And we'll be sure to glorify you in it. In Jesus' name. Blessed be your name, oh Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Bless your holy name, God. Amen. Hallelujah, amen, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory Thank you, Jesus. to your name, Thank Jesus. You. Thank you. Are worthy to be praised. Oh, Lord, you. we praise you. Thank Hallelujah. You. Thank, you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Sister Perida. We appreciate you. Thank you for recording and just being there at the background for us making sure this is all there for those who come later thank you evangelist june thank you pastor jones mama Coco. thank you, thank mama you. Right thank in the background we thank you thank you for being Amen. here Ooh, the lord will give us grace for all this reading and reading and <laughs> learning and growing and living in their realities amen amen, amen. 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 i'm looking forward to the graduation of pillars next month i sure hope i can attend it live we'll see amen <laughs> So, Sister Rhoda, I got a question. Yes, So, um, how long you've been doing the book club? August will be three years. And was was it uh, a collaboration with Dr. Mildred? Yes, Dr. Mildred. The Lord gave her the dream, and uh, I guess I was foolish enough to say yes. <laughs> No, it's a book thing that I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, she, Pastor, yes, you know she, she's a book person. You know, she's a doctor, too. So. Oh, okay. She's a book person, so she's okay. well qualified for this kind of thing. Because she did one book in one night, one sitting. We, oh, yeah. we, we were reading a book, got up to all chapter five, feeling good. She break out with chapter 11. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Staparita. She, she's... <laughs> Amen. Yeah.